The war in Ukraine is a catastrophe. Now, this podcast is made by Bologna, um, and everybody in the studio today works for Bologna. We are an environmental organization, and we have been active and present in Russia for 30 years, working on environmental issues. Today, we're not going to cover our entire Russian history, but discuss how the reality of working with environmental issues has changed over time in Russia, and what happens now as a result of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. We all know that war has direct and horrible humanitarian costs, and there's also a huge environmental impact. Now, I am in no way capable of discussing any of this by myself, and for that reason, I have two members of our Russian team here today, which also explains why this episode in its entirety will be in English. Welcome to Klodebri. Human influence has warmed the atmosphere, ocean, and the land. A code rent for humanity. How dare you! Climate change is here now. Store nedbörsmängder har fört till flod. Det var värre är det. Global uppvärmning är det avgörande orsak. FNs nya klimarapport åtvarar mot människoskapte klimatändringar. Klimatändringar. Now, when I say Russian team, you're uh, you're not Russians, both of you. Um, one of your faces I see all the time, Oskar Nyo. Welcome. Thank you. Um, you work on uh, Russian issues from the Oslo office. Correct, right? yeah. Yeah. And uh, also, you've been with Bologna for a long time. You, uh, you know the... Uh, you know our Russian team very well. And also visiting on this special occasion is uh, Ksenia Vakrusheva. Hello. Hey. Um, and uh, you come from St. Petersburg. Yes. But you live in Bulgaria. True. Uh, but you work on uh, Russian environmental issues from there and you have been for some time. Yes, it's been 10 years already. I've been working for Bilono. And uh, yeah, it's uh, today's topic is obviously a big one and a difficult one, and uh, uh, we we just gotta go straight to it. I think uh, Ksenia, did you the the invasion that started on February twenty four? Did you see this coming? That's a difficult question. Um, what can I say? I did see coming the worsening of the situation, uh, the worsening of the political situation in Russia, the worsening of the economic situation in Russia, and it, and it didn't start uh, on the 24th of, of February, just 2022. Uh, it started uh, much earlier. Uh, but honestly, in no way, I've seen coming, uh, I've seen the war and the conventional, the open war coming these days. For me, it was very shocking news, and uh, I thought, okay, Putin is uh, capable of uh, carrying out uh, uh, so-called hybrid wars, and he shows that uh, in 2008, invading Georgia, uh, heating up conflicts in uh, Transnistria, in Moldova, uh, invading uh, Crimea and uh, eastern parts of Ukraine in 2014, so I thought it will be more or less the same kind of strategy this time. No, I haven't seen the full war coming. And uh, you've been uh, working on environmental issues and working um, politically in Russia for quite some time. Uh, can you describe what uh, what you have experienced from when you started getting involved in, in politics and environmental issues and and how things changed from the beginning until recent times? I think I began uh, active in the political and uh, civil society issues in Russia uh, around 2005 uh, when I was uh, uh, studying in the university. And I, uh, I was uh, quite interested in elections, uh, in uh, 
political parties uh, in the political systems uh, uh, and I got to know how it works in Russia um, and I already saw their uh, frauds during elections uh, and uh, uh, Squares uh, l- limited uh, space for uh, media freedom, uh, and uh, that's uh, that time I was uh, uh, clearly thinking that I don't like the uh, the current uh, um, political si- uh, po- political situation and the people in power. Uh, so I joined the opposition. Uh, so. Democracy in in Russia obviously had uh, its flaws already in in 2005. Uh, how has it been developing since? My feeling is that it was gradually worsening, step by step, uh, with a quite thoughtful strategy of uh, first uh, uh, limiting uh, media freedom, uh, restricting. Uh, and uh, grabbing, uh, getting influence uh, on the uh, main med- media channels, um, gathering all power in one hand, centralization of power, less uh, power to uh, regions and uh, municipalities, uh, less uh, space for civil society, restrictive legislation for uh, non-governmental organizations, uh, um, Repressions uh, against uh, political activists, repressions against uh, civil society activists, and environment was always uh, one of the topics which, uh, uh, w- which was uh, one of the most pressured all the time. And environmental activists uh, were uh, always uh, uh, the ones uh, that were getting this uh, uh, negative attention from authorities. Um. Oscar, what's what's it been like from your perspective? And and for you, did it start with? Uh, uh, did you want to? Did you have a special interest in environmental issues or Russian issues? What came first, and how did you come end up with combining the two? Well, um, I've been brought on upon environmentalism from my, when I was very young, and to be honest, I used to. Uh, participate in a club for children uh, which had a mascot that looked like an octopus very Norwegian uh, thing Brekulfklubben <laughs> um, but I started getting interested in, in Russia around 2007 2008 um, and my perspective on like the situation in Russia at the time is perhaps a bit different from Xenia's because the story that I heard was the story that was told here in the west that uh, there was uh, hope for Russia that there was a chance that uh, we could see a Russia that had issues in moving in the right direction, but perhaps was moving in the right direction at some point, could be. Um, and that is also why I I remember how um, witnessing the fact that uh, civil society and... and uh, uh, freedoms in Russia became more and more restricted uh, as time went by and that was uh, well a very uh, negative experience for me because uh, Russia is a country uh, that uh, I've spent very much time on and trying to uh, improve both uh, the environment and the way uh, well this discussion in society works in Russia uh, has been important in in my life, and I see that things are well, going in the opposite direction. Because it looked from the outside, as you say, it looked promising for a while. Uh, the Soviet Union came to an end. Uh, democracy was instated. Uh, we all saw Boris Yeltsin on TV, and everyone laughed a bit when he was drunk. And but it was all. Uh, it was a lot of it was pretty good vibes and it seemed like things were moving in the right direction and then at some point it started uh, going backwards again is that how is my analysis <laughs> there were quite many turning points uh, that time uh, i'm still quite young to remember 
uh, in details the politics that uh, was during Boris Yeltsin. Uh, but uh, uh, analyzing backwards uh, what's happened there, that uh, uh, not all decisions uh, taken there were going into right directions uh, and uh, uh, not all elections were uh, very free and uh, fair. Um, economically, there were uh, quite bad decisions taken at that time, which uh, uh, resulted into uh, creating the oligarchy system and uh, keeping uh, a huge number of uh, part of population poor. Uh, and this is also not the best uh, ground for creating the democratic state. Right. Well, this process is when a lot of uh, previously state-owned properties ended up in the hands of a few wealthy individuals. Yes, and uh, the main thing is that this wealth didn't came from uh, didn't come from uh, their uh, right entrepreneurship. Uh, this uh, uh, it came from the state money. It just uh, because people were close to the bureaucrats and uh, they used uh, uh, the state money to buy all this uh, previously state-owned property uh, into their hands. So, frankly speaking, it was just distributed among the friends and people who were close uh, in, in the circle. Mm. That was uh, one of the uh, wrong decisions, uh, how to liberalize the economic system. Uh, Oscar, you spent a period living in St. Petersburg around 2011-2012. Um, what was your experience then and uh, were you surprised by anything you experienced while you were there? Well, uh, when I, I moved to, to Russia first time in 2011, I had this perception of this uh, country being quite well familiar in one sense and at the same time very um, strange and unfamiliar. Um, the culture was so recognizable, but at the same time, quite different. And uh, and um, uh, at the time, I, I still had hopes for for uh, uh, Russia moving in the right direction. I was, uh, well, there were some signs that we wish, obviously in, in hindsight, should have thought differently about, for example, the invasion of, uh, of Georgia back in 2008. Which I think a lot of people in our part of the world don't really remember that much. No, I think it was uh, overshadowed by a lot of other crises at the time, including the financial crisis, mm. uh, which was more well, affected us uh, directly uh, in the West. But um, I remember really getting an insight into the issues uh, that were plaguing Russian society. When I started working with environmental organizations, I started working in uh, in uh, Nature and Youth, not too long ago, a Norwegian youth organization who had the partners in, in Russia. Uh, and that's how I saw that the Russian system um, might look like it uh, works in a okay away from the outside but really there are a lot of obstacles and it has been and it's become uh, worse uh, and for me the turning point really was back in 2012-2013 when uh, after uh, Vladimir Putin had uh, sat two periods from 2000 uh, until 2008 he changed places with uh, with the Dmitry Medvedev um, so that uh, Medvedev became the, the president and uh, Vladimir Putin became the prime minister. And then in 2012, at the re-elections, uh, uh, Putin again uh, became the candidate for presidency, won that election. And so that they led swapped to, seats again? Yeah, they swapped seats again. And, and uh, it's remained the same ever since? Yeah, Putin has been sitting uh, in the president's chair since that. Um, but uh, that led to protests in Russia because... Uh, they uh, there was a part of the population who didn't think that that was okay. They wanted change, and I think, at least that's my impression, that that resulted uh, in uh, a skepticism among uh, authorities to to um, civil society and to people who were able to protest. And they uh, 
ushered in legislation that uh, could be used to control those parts of society that uh, were critical towards authorities. Um, one of the f- more famous parts of that legislation is the law on foreign agents, uh, which um, many might have heard about. But that law, in short, stipulates that uh, if you, uh, as an uh, environmental organization, for example, get uh, funding from abroad, and at the same time uh, conduct so-called political activity, which is not further defined, you can be labeled a foreign agent. And what that means is, one, that you get increased uh, demands from state authorities for uh, reports, regular reports about what you're doing, what you're spending that funding on, which is a big administrative burden and takes away time from what you're actually supposed to do as, for example, an environmental organization. But it's also... uh, a brand or for for an agent name is something that reminds uh, Russians about uh, Soviet times, spies, uh, foreign influence that is uh, uh, that has well no good intentions, uh, and that label really prevents um, an organization who gets it uh, from doing it its work and and be per- well perceived as a just and and right part of of discussion in society in in Russia. It's also accompanied by other laws, uh, for example, about uh, unwanted organizations, which is a more serious uh, label that, uh, well, in reality, um, says you're not allowed to operate in Russia anymore. Right. And that uh, type of legislation gives the authorities the control over which organizations are allowed to operate freely and which are not. Uh, And that's when it started really becoming obvious to me that this was going downhill. And what kind of uh, label has been put on Bologna in Russia? Bologna got the label of uh, foreign agents, both uh, the entity in Murmansk and uh, uh, in St. Petersburg. It was in 2016 and 17. Uh, But... uh, since we have lawyers in our team in St. Petersburg, we and uh, uh, we discussed it with uh, broad uh, uh, civil society and uh, other uh, NGOs in St. Petersburg and uh, in uh, other uh, parts of the country. So we developed some ways how to escape this un- uh, from this law, and uh, legally we managed to get out of this jurisdiction of this law. Okay. So we transformed the legal entity and continued working uh, more, more or less as previously. Yes, that's true. It took lots of our efforts. It took time of our employees, especially lawyers and accountants. Uh, but uh, yes, we managed to get it through. So uh, gradually, uh, through all these years, the space for civil society and the environmental uh, activists was... Uh, uh, coming uh, more narrow, more narrow. With this uh, set of legislation of foreign agents, it became, uh, again, uh, more narrow. And now with the invasion of the war and all the uh, invasion of Ukraine and all these uh, 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 last pieces of legislation which uh, actually restricts you of saying any kind of uh, thing which is uh, against uh, the political party strategy, uh it actually ends up that you don't have uh, space to work anymore without putting yourself at risk right uh if you're advocating for uh for human rights for the environment for lgbt rights you all struggle in today's russian society basically yeah, yeah could... sometimes even social issues uh, can be uh sensitive to that mm. Because you could argue that the legislation that has been made in Russia over the last well, 10 or so years, it's created specifically uh, uh, without clear definitions of what the law thinks uh, is uh, well a breach of, of, of that legislation. And that means that as uh, the, the justice system can uh, sentence you, uh, will give you fines or sentence you to jail and based on that law um, as it sees fit. Right, um, they can decide for themselves how much they dislike you and then punish you based on that. Exactly. Hmm. Uh, and that also means that as an organization or an individual, you will have to find the balance in your situation. 
the first couple of times that uh, an organization was labeled foreign agents, the rest of uh, civil society obviously looked at that process and thought, how can we avoid this? How uh, can we continue to do our work without having to end up in, uh, with this brand? And that's where you, uh, even though you are not directly sanctioned yet, you start thinking, uh, how can I adapt? And thus, how can I uh, say what I want to say, but without saying the things that authorities won't allow me to? And that type of self-censorship really limits uh, the freedom of, a, of an organization to be critical of decisions that are being made in society about uh, uh, the authorities, the government, but also about other people in power who might have connections to uh, the authorities and thus are able to uh, make sure that you are punished uh, for, for well, putting spokes in their wheels, wheels uh, so to say. So, but despite these obstacles, up until the start of the war, Bologna still operated two offices in Russia, uh, one in Murmansk, one in St. Petersburg. Um, what were they able, what have they been able to achieve despite all the obstacles that are put in place for them? Well, we, we opened offices in 1994 in Murmansk first, and then in uh, 1998 in St. Petersburg. Uh, and those uh, two offices have been focusing on a bit different subjects. But uh, the first subject that we in Bologna uh, focused on was uh, nuclear safety and security in, uh, in the Russian north, close to the Norwegian border. And uh, that work was really uh, about uh, gathering and uh, republishing important information about the potential environmental consequences of, uh, of um, the operations of the Northern Fleet in, in, in Russia, or the old Soviet Northern Fleet, uh, where uh, bases uh, for, for submarines, for example, uh, were, well, because of the uh, dire economic, uh, economical situation in, in the 90s, neglected, didn't have resources to keep uh, radioactive material uh, safe and secure. And that issue was something uh, that was not talked about in Russian society. Uh, Bologna brought that information to the surface uh, and created a discussion around it. And that discussion um, ended up uh, becoming a concern also for uh, the international community which uh, went into to, uh, aid Russia with uh, fin uh, finances and technical help, resulting in um, lifting of, of around 200 uh, uh, used submarines that were just floating uh, and rusting uh, at harbor and could potentially sink some of them, uh, which would uh, have, could have led to, to the spread of radioactivity in their environment. And that is the type of work that we have conducted well, until now. We have followed these projects, uh, tried to uh, help aid the Russian nuclear industry in, in involving people in decisions that are being made uh, to construct new nuclear uh, power plants or to build uh, storages for, for nuclear and radioactive waste. And that process uh, has yielded uh, some results. Um, but at the same time, it has become more and more difficult to uh, w work with a civil society that is more and more restricted. Mm. Um, and in St. Petersburg, uh, we created an environmental rights center. And I guess Xenia can say something about what uh, that Yeah, meant. so besides uh, the nuclear topic w w where we worked uh, as experts and uh, trying to... Uh, advise and push uh, uh, Rosatom and uh, uh, nuclear authorities to uh, to involve public in their uh, discussions and uh, uh, disclose information about their projects in the first place. Uh, we worked uh, a lot of uh, uh, a lot with the environmental information. You know that Russia never signed the Orhus Convention. And uh, we were uh, pushing for that uh, and uh, trying to uh, to get this as the norm that environmental information should be public, that everyone uh, who wants to get environmental information from authorities should should be able to get it, 
uh, we had uh, the website and the magazine regularly publishing stories about what's happening with environmental uh, problems and uh, with environment uh, in uh, different regions. We helped local activists to bring their topics up in the uh, media agenda because uh, uh, not everyone knows what's happening in uh, uh, Bashkiria or uh, other uh, regions. Yeah. Uh, and uh, uh, national media is not uh, used to and uh, to bring up these topics. And uh, uh, most of the time, uh, especially it was relevant before uh, this invasion of uh, social media, uh, that local activists and the local people didn't have any opportunities to uh, to spread their information. So we were uh, providing this platform for spreading the uh, environmental information from the regions uh, uh, to wider audience and to wider public. Also, we had lawyers who... Um, who gave legal advice to local environmental uh, organizations and uh, individuals who wanted to uh, fo- uh, to solve environmental problems that they had um, in their regions, uh, like certain violations uh, concerning illegal dumps, for example, or illegal logging of uh, woods, uh, constructions in natural areas, uh, um, industrial pollution, which is uh, outside the standards and norms. So all these kind of issues, uh, we had to educate people how to work with this uh, in a civilized way using the existing legal system. Hmm. It still was possible several years ago. Uh, we had some winning, um, some wins in courts, but <laughs> year by year, uh, it, it was uh, more difficult, it was more pointless to go into courts because uh, the judgments, uh, the the, uh, the court system is uh, completely not independent and uh, if uh, the project uh, that you're fighting against uh, is connected to someone uh, in power, that, then it's just uh, no way you win anyway. So, and then after the invasion, uh, it became obvious that we cannot continue our operations. We cannot uh, continue working with the authorities because we completely disagree with the with the current politics uh, and any contact with them uh, can be envisioned as a uh, uh, kind of support. Uh, no, we decided not, we are not going to have any contacts with them uh, anymore uh, for for unknown period of time while it's uh, and the war is still on and we closed our, our operations in Russia both because it uh, it doesn't have uh, sense to work uh, the way we worked and it puts uh, employees at risk uh, uh, if we continue working in Russia and they are in Russia. And we'll get back to how uh, Bologna intends to work on Russian issues from here on and into the future. Uh, but before that, I just want to uh, I just want to hear you describe what made you leave because you left Russia uh, quite a while ago, uh, yeah. and you say it's because you saw things moving in the wrong direction. Yes, that's true. I moved out of Russia in 2014 before the invasion of Crimea because uh, already that time I saw that this negative trend, uh, negative political trend and economic trend that uh, uh, things are not going to be better. I think I thought at that time that uh, political pressure will be uh, fiercening will be more uh, uh, strong, uh, that uh, space for civil society will be becoming less and less. And for personal reasons, I just it was too much uh, to handle for me. Uh, both uh, uh, I was working in, uh, in Bologna at that time and I was uh, being involved in uh, uh, oppositional politics. And I thought that I can't handle it uh, psychologically. So I decided to move out. 
but uh, uh, I moved out uh, and uh, uh, part time I continued to working with uh, to work with Bilona on environmental issues in Russia. You started basically working remotely then six years before everybody else did. Yeah, so mm. for me, pandemic wasn't a surprise or some kind of uh, shocking change of lifestyle. Yeah. No, I was the uh, home office uh, way before it became popular. What happened to the mindset of people as uh, laws were tightening, uh, civil liberties were gradually being taken away? Um, today, I think uh, a lot of people look at Russian society with frustration and they say, why aren't people uh, protesting more against what is happening? Um, uh, a lot of um, people uh, seem apathetic about the situation. Um, is that is that part of uh, is that part of uh, is that because of politics as well? That's a difficult question uh, in terms of uh, you can't say people as a whole. Uh, Russia is uh, how many? One hundred thirty, at least one hundred forty uh, million people living there. People are different. They have different uh, living strategies. What mm, there are a lot of different points of views. I can't say that the the, the society is a monolith. No. Uh, I would say that the society is very uh, atomized, that people are uh, closed in their uh, close circle of family and uh, closest friends. They try to survive. Uh, it's a, a lot of po uh, poverty in Russia, especially in regions and in small towns outside big cities, outside of Moscow, outside of St. Petersburg. Even though St. Petersburg is also considered as not that uh, uh, rich city. So uh, <clears throat> I would never say that uh, Russian people think that. No, they think different. There are certain strategies. A lot of people uh, just don't trust in any kind of uh, authority or power. Uh, they think they cannot influence the political system. They think they cannot influence policies. That's why they don't go voting, because they also see, and that's true, that uh, 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 elections are frauded. Uh, so they just don't go voting and are not involved in the uh, civil society or political activism. There are other people who are involved and they try to protest. They were protesting back in 2005, back in 2007, back in 2011, 12, uh, and because all of, these uh, years. Elections. Because of different uh, things. Uh, and if you go, uh, if you look at the environmental activism, actually during uh, re recent like 10 years, we saw more and more people involved in environmental uh, initiatives. Uh, not all of them were uh, classically protesting on the streets, but uh, a lot of people were involved informationally. They were trying to uh, uh, build communities around a certain local issue, uh, writing petitions, uh, going to local or regional governments, uh, involving media, uh, trying to spread the word. So it was there. Uh, when they, but naturally, when they meet with the uh, fierce force, like uh, detentions uh, during protests uh, or threats for dismissal from your work or threats uh, of uh, uh, dismissal from the university, then not everyone agrees on that. And other people see uh, how uh, what's the reaction of the authorities is to this uh, civil society initiatives. Many people think, okay, it's uh, it's not the thing that uh, I want I want to risk, so they are not getting involved. Uh, there are also a lot of people like me who decided to flee the country because there are more opportunities. We have only one life, and sometimes it's uh, better to move uh, move out and uh, bring some uh, 
good thing elsewhere than being depressed and uh, not uh, having any opportunities in your in your own country. I know for a fact that uh, the information work that's been uh, that's been done by the the Russian uh, offices of Bologna has been uh, very important, and then the traffic to our Russian website is by far the largest of all the three websites that we have. We have one Norwegian site, we have one that's more EU centric, and then there's the Russian website, and it's been hugely popular. And uh, Bologna has been. Um, as far as environmental organizations go, go uh, one of the most important uh, of its kind in Russia. I would agree to that, yeah. Yeah. I, th I think um, information is sort of the key to all uh, civil society activism, right? If you don't have information that you can discuss and, and base yourself on, it's very hard to um, uh, oppose projects that uh, are, for example, have a negative uh, impact on the environment or have a constructive discussion about what changes need to be made to a certain project to make it more viable. And so for us, this has taken uh, two different forms. One thing is, as uh, Xenia said, we helped uh, others spread their information about environmental issues. Uh, we've also spread our own uh, information on our websites. Another important aspect that we have worked with is uh, to compensate for the lack of education that uh, is happening in Russia on environmental issues and what the environmental actually environment actually means for us humans. Um, going into schools, helping teachers actually talk about uh, pollution, the climate issue, these type of things that are not part of the Russian curriculum uh, in the sense that we know uh, here in Norway, for example. And that is important also for people to be aware of these uh, or like the general issue and what that might mean and then about concrete issues that actually arise in society now I, um, I think that is one of the reasons that what Bologna has been doing in Russia has been uh, so important and um, also the reason that we think it's uh, definitely worth it to continue working with Russia despite the circumstances that uh, uh, have been brought on by the invasion of Ukraine we could have taken the easy route uh, many years ago. We could have chosen to stay out of uh, the controversial, the politically controversial topics and uh, worked on, you know, picking up uh, garbage from the street or something that uh, nobody would disagree with. But I guess that was never an option. No, I think... Uh... Well, that that's a, that's a solution to a uh, problem. Oh. Yeah, but the, but the history time... history of Bellona's office in Russia started with the uh, fighting for environmental rights, for bringing up topic of environmental rights. Because at that time, twenty years ago, even human rights activists didn't recognize environment as a uh, right for favorable environment as a part of human rights. So we brought this uh, uh, topic up. And uh, we were always working with uh, environmental rights issues, not just uh, the things that can be done mm, positively by changing your life lifestyle, but systemic changes that should be done in the society, otherwise uh, uh, your lifestyle wouldn't help. Mm -hmm. And a lot of environmental problems in Russia were connected and still connected with the corruption cases. Without systemic change in the society, in the power system, uh, you are not going to uh, reach the sustainable uh, environmental um, way of uh, uh, living and uh, uh, producing things and uh, uh, existence. Yeah? Uh, it's uh, that's why we were working with the lawyers. That's why we were working with the. Uh, public participation in decision making. Yes, we were trying to uh, work with the authorities to the extent we could and um, we could do. Uh, and with uh, educating people to be active as civil society, to have their voice, to be educated and to be able to uh, say this, uh, what you think. 
And then the war started earlier this year. Uh, what was it like talking to our colleagues that were still were still in Russia at the time uh, after this started? What did you talk about? Uh, I remember uh, them being in shock. That's one thing. Um, I also remember um, them being worried about what this would mean for uh, their workplace, uh, what Bologna uh, would decide to do uh, with our offices in Russia. And uh, I think uh, the reason they were worried about that is because um, much of the rhetoric about the war in Ukraine in Russia from Russian authorities and, and, and state media is based around the fact that um, the West and uh, forces there uh, want to make uh, life difficult for Russia as a state. And uh, to some extent, Bologna as an originally Norwegian organization that uh, worked on, uh, at least partly on funds from, from, uh, from abroad, could be viewed as a representative of those forces that were, well, didn't mean Russia well. And what that would mean for, for our employees was unclear both to us here in, in, in Norway, but also to them. Uh, and uh, um, how is it possible to actually talk about uh, important issues in society, be it environmental or other, without at the same time uh, being able to address what is going on uh, in Ukraine, the war. And it's it became so clear to us that this is going to be almost impossibly hard to do when uh, legislation was created that made it uh, illegal to use the word war in, uh, in the public and to criticize or hint about uh, the fact that the Russian army was doing something wrong uh, abroad. These type of things... Uh, makes it very hard for uh, uh, an, an active uh, thinking and engaged person to uh, actually exist in a, in a society without uh, making mistakes that could cost them dearly. I think that uh, worried them as much as it did us. Yes, there was uh, no disagreement that, uh, that this is a horrible uh, disaster that we cannot continue working and publishing our regular articles uh, and notes uh, without making a point that this war is a disaster and it shouldn't be going. But by publishing it explicitly on our informational resources, uh, it meant that uh, we will put people who were um, still in Russia uh, at risk. So we decided that we will uh, suspend the operations. We stopped uh, publishing uh, anything. Uh, our social media, our websites went silent since then. And uh, we decided then to move the entire operation out of Russia. It took some time to discuss what we could and should do but uh, yeah after a couple of uh, couple of months we uh, decided on that option uh, it was pretty clear quite early that it had to be done but uh, getting there is uh, it, it takes some time and uh, we do think that we can uh, keep doing much of uh, the important work that we have done particularly when it comes to uh, spreading good, uh, sound, uh, scientifically uh, correct information about environmental uh, issues in Russia from the outside. And also um, support civil, the rest of the environmental movement and civil society uh, in Russia from, from the outside. So we uh, have moved parts of uh, our team uh, to... Um, and the Baltics to uh, to Vilnius in in, uh, in Lithuania, where they will be uh, continuing 
uh, as much of the previous work as possible, but no longer from within Russia. And for, for those uh, Russian colleagues who have uh, uh, decided to move there, to continue working from there, um, what, what consequences does that have for them? I guess uh, they can't easily go back home at this point. Theoretically, they can. Uh, it, it became much more difficult for male colleagues uh, since the mobilization uh, started. Then, uh, yes, of course, it's uh, uh, quite dangerous uh, and risky for them to go back because uh, they can uh, uh, receive the... Uh, what's the name in English? Uh, mm. when you're, They can be drafted into uh, the yeah, army. They can yeah. be drafted into the army. And... Uh, <clears throat> No one wants that, of course, obviously. So for this particular reason, they're not going uh, to go to Russia anytime soon. So we have um, a new office that's starting up in, in Vilnius and uh, uh, working on uh, Russian environmental uh, issues from there. Are we sort of back to square one? Kind of. To some extent, yeah. Because this we had to plan our work from the scratch from the beginning, uh, rethinking our uh, goals, mission, ways of uh, working, and uh, ways of uh, uh, getting to our target audience. Yes, we had to rethink all these uh, things uh, from the very beginning. Hmm. And we will change our. We are changing our work pretty much. There's also part of what worries us now is that uh, when we first started working in Russia thirty years ago in the in the nineties, uh, what we saw was uh, the the um, the result of a, a system, the Soviet Union, that weren't able to handle uh, the environmental issues it created. And what could happen now is that because the focus is elsewhere, there is no civil society or environmental movement that is strong enough to be able to uh, keep the authorities and the industry in check. We can end up, uh, if and when we return, because that is our goal, when it's possible, we will try to go back to Russia. We can end up coming back to Russia where, again, we see these issues uh, piling up because there is no conversation about these issues or no system to keep problems from arising. Uh, and that is, uh, of course, something we will try to work our best uh, to uh, avoid. But, of course, being outside Russia is different from being inside. And one huge uh, issue is uh, obviously the war itself. Uh, we all know about, as I mentioned uh, in the introduction to this podcast, uh, the, the humanitarian consequences and the political consequences and security consequences that it has. But a war also has an environmental impact, um, which, uh, yeah, uh, can you describe a little bit what, what, what that's about? Uh, yes, so when we discussed uh, how can we restart our work from outside on Russian topics, uh, we thought that uh, we will start with uh, uh, writing about environmental consequences of the war uh, in Ukraine, uh, on the territory of Ukraine, and in Russia, and uh, to some extent globally. So uh, we published uh, a sort of articles uh, on that. Uh, and then uh, we described uh, all kind of uh, uh, effects uh, which we can see now already, or the potential effects that uh, and risks uh, that uh, we can we might experience uh, if uh, the war continues. Uh, so that was the uh, uh, like the way to handle it. Is like direct consequences and indirect consequences. Direct consequences that uh, you can see already now in. Uh, uh, in Ukraine, uh, that's uh, forest fires uh, uh, when mm, missiles are uh, getting into the forest. Uh, that's uh, mm, 
damage to infrastructure, uh, damage to industrial facilities, which uh, can bring pollution, uh, air pollution and uh, oil, uh, soil con contamination, all sorts of uh, uh, <clears throat> industrial pollution, uh, which is caused by uh, physical damage of the facilities. That's also a territorial problem because uh, a lot of uh, a big part of Ukraine now uh, is uh, has agricultural land and they cannot use it uh, the the lands which is uh, on occupation now under under Russian occupation. So it means uh, that uh, they eased uh, uh, the legislation to use uh, uh, not agricultural land as agricultural land. Uh, which means that uh, the space for natural environment and for biodiversity will be shrinked. Uh, the same thing we see uh, as the consequences of this uh, war uh, in other countries as well, like in Brazil. They also decided to uh, ease this kind of legislation uh, because they saw the opportunity for themselves to grow more uh, plants, food that can be exported. Uh, in the situation when uh, uh, export from Ukraine uh, is uh, has dropped, mm. um, also the ease of legislation in in Russia to um, to cut uh, trees, uh, uh, to cut forests of wood, uh, especially in natural reserve areas like around Baikal uh, Lake. Uh, also, great impact is uh, ha has um, sanctions. Western sanctions on uh, Russia, uh, which limits uh, uh, transfer of uh, technologies, uh, and that resulted uh, uh, in ease of uh, environmental standards for industries, and in particular for uh, car industry, uh, for automobile. Uh, you can, uh, if you are producing in Russia, you can produce cars with uh, Euro Zero standard, uh, which is. Uh, going uh, way very, back. Very back old emission standards. Yes. Yeah. yes. So uh, this uh, uh, this kind of environmental consequences. I think uh, this is this is a topic where we could uh, go on uh, forever. But um, I think that the purpose of today's conversation was to sort of um, describe what uh, what uh, our uh, experience working in Russia uh, has been like and uh, how the war has changed everything both for for the world and and for us as an organization and that it has uh, direct environmental uh, consequences as well as all the other consequences that we know um, if someone's listening to this podcast and they feel like I'm just a uh, a small person, I I feel uh, apathetic about what's going on in the world. Um, uh, I would like to make a difference, but I don't know how. Do we have any piece of advice to to, to those people? Uh, yes, um, I think the, the latest history in Russia, or let's say the last 10, 20 years. Um, shows us a thing that can be important for us all to, to think about and that is the fact that um, civil society as we call it uh, is not uh, something unconcrete it's organizations it's people uh, it's us and uh, we have to keep uh, those that are in power in check we also have to help them make good decisions but that requires a conversation where uh, everybody is present and, and participates. And uh, the current conversation uh, in Russia is almost non-existent between civil society and power compared to what it should have been. And that means there is nobody to keep the authorities in check. And I think uh, what we just need to do as individuals uh, is to make sure that we participate in the societal processes that we can and uh, to keep powers in check because uh, that is uh, uh, well 
one of one of the important processes in society. Uh, and as long as we have those opportunities, we should use them. Go vote for the party that uh, you think has the best policies and will do the most good. Um, voice your opinion. Uh, support those causes that you think need supporting. Uh, and contribute to society that way. Be part of civil society. Be active. Yes, that's uh, important not to close eyes of uh, on even tiny, unjust and false thing that you see. And if everyone thought that I'm I'm just one person, I can't make a difference. If everyone thought the same way, then nothing would ever be achieved anywhere. So it's important to use your, your democratic uh, opportunities, I guess. Uh, Oscar and Ksenia, thank you for coming and for taking the time. Um, this has been an episode of Klodebri, which is a podcast from Bologna. We're an environmental organization with uh, offices in uh, Norway, in Brussels, in Berlin, and now also in Vilnius. Uh, on this podcast, we talk about environmental issues and related topics. And if you want to get in touch with us, you can reach us at uh, klodebri at bologna.no. And if you're not a Norwegian speaker, that's difficult to spell uh, just go on our website and uh, you'll find us there and you can get in touch with us there thanks for listening